Everybody raise a hand. No. Okay. Um, so we'll then um, uh, ask Rama to share his thoughts with us. Uh, Rama is the director of engineering at Google. He has done great work in terms of building some of the software infrastructure on which so many of these Google services run. Uh, I've had the pleasure of interacting with him right here in person at Purdue. And I'm looking forward to hearing his thoughts on this very provocative question. Rama, take it away. Thanks very much, Saurabh, and thanks everyone for making time for this. Uh, it's actually an indeed very exciting time to be in this whole area, which is adv advancing so rapidly. Uh, oftentimes, uh, these days, we are having to reset our baseline on what we think is really possible because what we think is impossible starts to sort of happen and then you have to reset the baseline. And that seems to be happening quite rapidly these days. So one way to think about this is uh, if I look at uh, in 2008, the National Academy of Engineering published 14 grand challenge problems for engineering uh, for the century, for the 21st century. And if I look at those 14, I would venture to guess that by the end of this decade, six of them will not remain grand challenge problems because we'll have already substantially solved them. And these are advanced personalized learning, enhanced virtual reality, reverse engineer the brain, engineer better medicines, advanced health informatics, and engineer the tools for new scientific discovery. I think the pace of progress in each of these is substantial. And by the end of this decade, my guess and my projection is where I can afford to be wrong is that these will not remain grand challenge problems for the century because we'll have solved them substantially. So I was asked to focus on questions two and three. And really the two is what are some of the foundational AI ML techniques that the current state of the art relies on? And in natural language processing, which is sort of the basis for much of, uh, you know, coding and AI and what have you. It really starts with, I think, a quick sketch of the history where you know, word embeddings was a critical breakthrough where you sort of transform words into floating point vectors. And such a representation in a multidimensional space is very powerful because computers can deal with floating point numbers and integers very easily. And they can operate on them, they can store them, they can manipulate them uh, very effectively. So this word embeddings and sort of associating meaning of a word in a multidimensional space as a floating point vector, as a representation, enabled many, many breakthroughs to happen. So this is in some ways I would think of as somewhat similar to a fast Fourier transform where you transform data in one domain to the frequency domain, because in the frequency domain, you can partition it, you can operate on it in parallel, you can sum it up to get your uh, uh, total fo uh, Fourier transform. And so it enables so many applications in signal processing and telephony and what have you. So similar kind of capability occurred because of being able to convert words into word embeddings as floating point vectors, very foundational. The next breakthrough I think is from the sequence models of uh, you know, recurrent neural networks, LSTMs, uh, because language you read from left to right in most languages and you read one word at a time and then associate a meaning with it. Uh, turned out to be very powerful technique with some drawbacks in that because you were going in a sequence, it was slow. And oftentimes if the sentence was very long, you were not able to keep the context of what the meaning of the whole sentence is as well as you could have. So that sort of led to the new breakthrough in transformers uh, as a mechanism for like natural language understanding. And transformers came in, in 2018 uh, through BERT, which is the bidirectional encoder representations for transformers. So what you do is you read the sentence from both ends. So it's bidirectional and you encode it in that fashion so that you know for long sentences, you do not lose the meaning uh, as you go towards the end of the sentence, right? So to capture the whole meaning, it, it was far more effective. So that also lent itself to better parallelization and faster training of these natural language models. And so transformers really came from the translation world where you had to translate from one language to the other. And the order of words also sort of 
uh, had a difference of when you transfer from English to French, in French, the ordering is different. So you had to learn how to do that. And that led to the next breakthrough in attention models, which was a seminal paper from Google on attention is all you need. Uh, and attention models brought three aspects to the natural lang language understanding problem. First is positional encoding, where you encode each word with the position it occurs in the sentence. And the second is sort of the attention part, which is a neural network to identify the weightage and emphasis each words have in the sentence. And the third is self-attention. Sorry. Because third is self-attention because words have meaning in context. So if I bought a uh, expensive watch or I went to watch a cricket match, watch has different meanings depending on which sentence it is coming from. And then of course, accuracy started improving as you built larger models and trained with larger amount of data. And the existence of sort of, ex if you think of natural language processing as a very hard problem with not very clear semantics, programming languages are far simpler. They are much more structured and have very strict semantic meaning. So if computers can handle natural language processing, it goes without saying that they can handle programming languages and coding, right? And there is existence proof of Microsoft Copilot, which is integrated into Visual Studio, OpenAI's Codex, and AlphaCode from DeepMind, all of which are available in GitHub, uh, showing that you know it's improving at a very, very rapid pace. So will AI write all our software? No. Will it write a large part of it? Yes. Uh, will it mean that uh, software engineers are not needed? No. It's the same kind of uh, question that 40 years back in India, people were complaining that computers will replace humans. It replaced some human tasks, but it generated 100 times more jobs in other areas. So I think a similar uh, capability will be possible to be able to write much better software, to be able to understand what underlying architecture or hardware does to software performance. How do we improve performance? What do we learn from the performance differences? There'll be a huge opportunity for a feedback cycle in which not only the underlying computer architecture improves, but also the software quality improves, uh, enabling far bigger and more complex uh, applications to be possible. So what are the NLP techniques uh, do AI-based programming tools borrow? So I'll quickly cover in the short time Any I have. Time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rama, please go ahead. Please go ahead and finish off your train of thought. Yeah, the train of thought is, you know, the, the way to think about coding in AI is coding with AI help is similar to autocomplete for words. You can extend it to autocomplete for sentences and autocomplete to paragraphs and essays and then papers. It's similar to that where you know the AI can assist you with a structure and autofill code for you and then. You know, as you're filling in whatever you want to, in addition, it generates the test cases, it generates the runtime execution check and provides you with instant feedback on where there might be errors, just drastically improving your productivity. So the highest level of abstraction to think about here is very similar to, you know, uh, autocomplete or uh, what have you there. And then also as it's doing this to learn and build its own database, of, you know, okay, what changes did the user make? What suggestions did they ignore? What suggestions did they incorporate? What do we learn from it? So that the AI system continues to get better. Um, and there's so many applications of it. That's a quick sketch of uh, what I think. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rama. Uh, that was a quick run through of some of the foundational technologies that have been developed. Um, so now we are going to uh, hear from David. Uh, who is an assistant professor in our school. Um, he is a part of our DOD Institute, uh, as well as our, our CRISP Center. So David really is one of the leading lights in this area of uh, trying to understand how these really large black box models operate. So while we as novices play around with these black box models, David is one of the few people who can tell us why it operates in a particular way. So looking forward to hearing from David. And David, um, you have the floor now. Sure, thanks. So uh, I don't know if I can answer all of those questions that Sarab suggests, but uh, I'll try to give my, my best shot. Uh, brief, 
background, I work on deep generative models. So I'm kind of more on the fundamental ML side of things, uh, fundamental research on ML, uh, less in the practical engineering of like deploying real systems. So uh, Rama and some of the others are probably a lot better at knowing those kinds of things. I'm also not a particular natural language processing person. Uh, so I know a little bit, but uh, I can give my perspectives, but just, just as a brief note. Um, I, I want to offer two perspectives. Um, one is a practical perspective on this question. Uh, AI for coding, I think, will be a useful tool, but won't replace the software engineer. That's kind of my, um, my, my sense is it's really uh, a tool, just like so for writing tools, we went from typewriters to Word documents to spell check to Grammarly, and now we have chat GPT-3. I think on, on one level, it's a new thing. And on one level, it's just an advancement of the things we've already started to use. Um, I don't think it's somehow magically different in, in kind of its quality than say spell check, uh, you know, um, or being able like in Word documents to be able to edit and stuff that you weren't able to do with typewriters, it's much harder to edit. Um, same thing with math tools, you know, used to be calculations by hand, then there's a sliding ruler. Now there's, you know, then came calculators and now we have all sorts of stuff, right? Again, it's a progression of tools. Um, the fundamentals haven't changed. Uh, same thing with code. You know, we used to have Vim, I still like Vim. And then we got Visual Studio, code completion. Um, then came along kind of Stack Overflow. I mean, I think you, you don't think of Stack Overflow as a tool exactly, but I don't know any coder who doesn't search things that they don't immediately know and you often use Stack Overflow answers or at least use that to figure out what, what they should do next. Uh, I think in some ways that has become a huge tool, being able to Google things and Stack Overflow, et cetera. And now GitHub Copilot and these new tools. Again, I think this is kind of a progression of tools. I don't think yet we're, uh, and I'm not, I still think uh, it's not fundamentally different. Uh, again, qualitatively different. It's, it's now assisting, it's still a great yeah. assistant, but not uh, more than that. Um, so it may increase speed of development. It may really change the focus of the engineer going from low level to high level. So now a bunch of boilerplate code that you used to have to write can now automatically be written for you. But every application is going to be different. The designer will always have to give the right prompts. So we might end up being more of a prompt engineering type of thing, but you still have to know the fundamentals of code. And from the security perspective, you're always going to need to know really what everything is doing. Um, so <clears throat> that's that's another thing. Um, so we might, I still think kind of, uh, you know, even fancy tools, <laughs> shall I say, can't replace the engineer. Like no matter how fancy the tool gets, it still can't replace. And same thing with like building, construction, lots of other things, right? You have a really cool drill. It still doesn't replace the construction worker, right? Might make it faster, et cetera. Um, now, a technical brief on the technical perspective, I think of most of these things as conditional generative models. That's the perspective I kind of view from I'm a generative model person. Um, I think robustness from a technical perspective of generative models uh, is significantly understudied. So I think we understand supervised learning in a very kind of narrow sense with IID samples in distribution things. We have very good understanding uh, of that. To, you know, or much better understanding, shall I say. Uh, I think generative models, we don't have an understanding of what does it mean even to be general, generalize uh, well in generative models um, and even these conditional generative models. So do they, do these models say memorize or regurgitate well? I think yes, probably. Do they interpolate? Maybe, I think I'm a little skeptical. I tend to take a little skeptical approach here. Maybe they're mostly regurgitating, um, they might be able to interpolate between two concepts and, and actually produce something kind of novel in between concepts. Again, I think there's a lot of work that is trying to understand that. But do they extrapolate to kind of novel scenarios? I would I would say no, almost, almost assuredly, they probably don't extrapolate. And we don't even know how to really design things to really extrapolate into kind of novel scenarios. So I think it's kind of hidden because it's so big and it does do a lot of like simple things. But I think this extrapolation regime where people are thinking, oh, it's going to be able to do all these kind of novel things that we're never seeing in training and are kind of very interesting. Five I think. minute warning. Um, 
So that's, I, you know, again, I think this extrapolation is what people are thinking in terms of height, but that's actually not, I don't think these models will do that. And I don't think we have a basis just because they're really fancy. Uh, they are still doing some of the same things that simple, you know, kind of linear models are doing. Um, so I, I don't think they're going to extrapolate well. Uh, yeah, that's so that's the, from the technical perspective. Maybe I'm a pessimist, but I, I just am not confident that these are actually kind of doing what some people might think they are. That's it. All right. Uh, thank you, David. So um, we're going to move to Arundham from AWS, and uh, he's had a long and distinguished career in various aspects of machine learning uh, within the AWS org. And most recently, he's the director of the conversational AI uh, within the Alexa unit of AWS. So Arundham, you have the floor. Yeah. Um, hey, thanks for uh, having me here, Saurav. Um, uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm glad that I could uh, fit this in my schedule. Always uh, exciting to talk to students. Um, just one clarification, I, I'm actually with the Alexa uh, organization and I have nothing to do with AWS except I use a lot of their compute <laughs> internally. We are one of the biggest uh, users. Um, so um, I wanted to uh, focus on, you know, what is the state of AI-based programming today? And I think Rama covered a lot of that quite eloquently. Uh, from my perspective, you know, um, where um, the industry stands today, a lot of functional programming can be achieved uh, through the large language models that are in, uh, you know, various uh, stages of availability. AI is good at generating natural language or code completions based on a prompt. It can generate code recommendations <laughs> as well and uh, can recommend bug fixes, et cetera, that a lot of you have covered. Um, however, um, a, a very important area where people continue to be needed is actually to uh, stand up applications that uh, complete meaningful actions for customers. And this is where, uh, you know, the conversational UX or the conversational developer experience becomes really critical. And um, we have made some progress uh, in this area within Alexa because uh, of our uh, we have an offering to developers to build any Alexa uh, skill uh, with whatever use case they might think of uh, on a self-service manner without needing to talk to any Amazon employee. And in the process, what we found was um, AI generated programming was definitely not cutting it and developers uh, struggled a lot to come up with conversational uh, experiences. So one of the advances we made before the large language models were around was um, to come up with a LSTM based deep you know dialogue manager that any developer could use for any use case they can think of so if you search for books today on Alexa it's driven by these experiences uh, if you search for you know anything to buy it's driven by these experiences or if you want to just explore news articles, it also comes through these self-serve deep dialogue managers. Uh, what it is able to do is generate sequence of API calls and you know, reduce the uh, need for developers to write complex uh, code to understand how customers might interact with uh, a, a spoken language interface like Alexa's and not have to worry about all the ways natural language you know, might change based on how an API returns a certain value. And that uh, significantly reduces the time it takes for developers to bring high value actions to end users to whom they are you know, uh, with, you know, uh, bringing engaging experiences to. Um, we did a lot of this with uh, synthetic training data, essentially cutting out the need for any annotated data. Um, and what we found was, uh, because this was done, you know, uh, with a different technology, that the amount of data that you throw at it uh, increases the generalizability, of course, and 
in a self-serve uh, world, that became a key limiting factor for us. So given the current advances in large language models that work out of the box, I think these uh, interfaces, self-serve interfaces tend to become even more powerful and not burden the developer with ever having to worry about what is a conversational experience looking like. And they just focus on what's important for their business. Um, now, some of the limitations of, you know, this AI-based uh, techniques still remain that they cannot invent, you know, new algorithms for you. Uh, they won't be able to come up with the Viterbi algorithm. <laughs> so uh, regulated industries and mission critical applications will continue to require, you know, human expertise. Um, and uh, AI lacks the agency, frankly, today. Uh, it requires human input about what to write to produce code, and human programmers will still need to design and uh, develop. I'm in a warning. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll pause my remarks there, uh, and um, those are some of the thoughts that I wanted to share about where the state of the AI-based uh, programming world is. All right, thank you, Arunam. Um, we'll move on to Arvind, uh, who is an uh, assistant professor in our school. And um, Arvind uh, drives fear into the hearts of software vendors and uh, software developers in general, because he is so enormously talented in finding critical vulnerabilities in these software systems. But once people start working with him, including our corporate partners, they realize that uh, there's actually a great benefit to working with him because he also comes up with these very foundational techniques based on programming languages and language understanding and compiler techniques, which is able to make these software systems more secure. So he's not just in the process of breaking things, he's more importantly even in the process of making these things more secure. Uh, he's also a part of our CRISP Center and with that, the floor is yours, Arvind. We'll uh, hear from you on your thoughts on this. Thank you, sir. Thank you for saying that. I I, I do some defense work as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so there is uh, so one thing I I like to clear out is like there is there is a huge group of security researchers that think, rightfully so, that AI will produce insecure code. Okay, and they have experiments, large experiments, many papers. But one thing that I'm skeptical about in those areas of research is things are moving so fast that the results that you compute three months before are not valid now. So I have examples of two papers published by the same group of researchers that claim two completely different things. Six months before the AI generated code was insecure, six months after now the AI generated code was secure. So uh, with that, I'd like to say that eventually we'll move on to a, like we, we will we'll go to a state where AI most, mostly produces secure code, but it will produce only small amounts of code. It, uh, as many of you have said, like Arindam said, like it's hard to generate complete application. So it might not generate the complete application. However, AI will get good at generating these small snippets of code, secure snippets of code, but uh, small. And another thing to note is the AI generated code is well structured from software perspective. It's not hairy, it's not complex, it does not require this complex control flow, which security researchers or these security tools find hard to deal with. So we have we have a bunch of security tools that are good at uh, analyzing well structured code. So even if AI produces some code which has security vulnerabilities, we have decades amount of research that is good at finding bugs in those well-structured code. Okay. So there are techniques that will make sure that we can use to make sure that AI generated code is good. Okay. So now with that, how can AI help in ensuring that the security of other software that we write is better is it enables us to use formal models or like these model checking tools that were not possible before just because the small components are very hairy, they use complex logic, they were written by humans. So we, we cannot easily abstract the application. That's why we cannot use model checking tools. But now as we go forward, 
the more we start to use AI assistance for writing small parts of the programs, like small modules of the programs, the easier it gets for the developers and also for automated tools to abstract away the logic and use higher level formal methods, which help us prove certain properties of the application, like race conditions, or making sure that it doesn't, uh, there is no denial of service, which have been very hard or rather very application specific, which were out of security domain, like uh, security people did not even consider those in large scale. But now with AI-based programming, it, I think it's good for security people because we now have opportunity to find bigger bugs, no more buffer overflows, no more this race condition, no more these like small use after freeze, no more these things, but rather more application level bugs, more logic bugs. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm more on the positive side and uh, using AI-based programming or like these LLMs for, to generate sub-modules will be more much better to improve the security of applications because it allows us to use higher level tools that's not possible now imagine having a lib fuzzer or lib png uh, written in uh, written by ai assistants right so most of the bugs that we see in the small libraries are these very hairy small low level buffer overflows like we are not even seeing the big bugs, like the complex bugs. So these are still, we are seeing like this low level software vulnerabilities and which are hard to find by automated tools just because the code is hairy. The code is not well structured. It has a lot of pointers, but with AI based programming, when the code is well structured, the automated tools will find their way back. They will find these bugs and it's easier to make, uh, yeah, at, in, in summary, it's easier to make AI generated code secure rather than uh, just tossing away AI generated code as insecure. Yeah, that's, that's my one line summary. And then AI generated code helps us to use better tools and uh, to prove better properties about uh, our programs. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think I'm the first person who didn't get the warning. Good. <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you, all right. that's your warning um so uh this generated a lot of interest among our students many of them have already posted questions on piazza so I, I picked sort of some of the questions where there is overwhelming interest where multiple people are upvoting those questions and then i'll have some questions which are more from the left field uh which may require some quite specific thinking so let me start off with one, which is directed, I think, to educators, but maybe even broader than that. So the question is, what impact do you think AI will have on computer science education in the future, given that it appears to be quite easy to generate uh, code snippets or sample programs? So any of us who are involved in teaching undergraduate level classes on data structures or algorithms, I think we'll have to confront this at some point in time. So either from an academic standpoint, how do you think we should teach people better? Or from an industrial standpoint, what kinds of people would you like to see come out of our educational programs in this brave new world of AI-generated programs? Is it directed to someone here, Saurabh? Or you want no, to anybody can pick up the question. So my, my take is, you know, uh, the questions uh, that students get evaluated on will have to change, right? It could be that, hey, uh, you know, instead of saying, write this code, uh, your question could be, you know, the computer AI generated these different samples for the same function, analyze pros and cons, and, you know, explain why, right? So which forces you to understand what has been done, which forces you to be critical in thinking and uh, sort of understand the construction of the code and understand also its implications on performance, on you know, reliability on maintainability and, and all those aspects, which often get ignored because today, mostly it's saying, does your code work? But that's usually a very small part of it. And maybe it'll help emphasis on the far more important sustainability aspects for the long term. And also in understanding, making the programmers think more about the underlying hardware, which code snippet would be better for which kind of underlying architecture, why? And that kind of critical thinking uh, would also help the engineers become better engineers and also improve software, improve the underlying hardware. So I think the kind of questions can change uh, significantly to ensure learning is happening 
And in fact, learning is happening in a more critical way where the students think and analyze and study and come up with ideas and ways to verify and construct experiments. So I think all those will become far more possible with uh, these kind of capabilities. Got it, makes sense, Rana. Yeah, I wanted to add a little bit to what Rama said. Um, I think the functional coding sort of the, you know, um, tasks which are very repetitive as happens with many industries, you know, will slowly start not needing, you know, that repetitive task training, but it will be replaced with higher value uh, uh, generation up the chain and end to end system design, which is often not possible for, uh, you know, engineers to just, you know, come together today and deliver something that works for large pools of the end user population that will that kind of a end to end design skill and being able to deliver end to end working systems would become possible and required. I mean, that delivery of such capabilities and experiences would become possible. And so the skill sets that, uh, you know, go with it would become the new critical uh, skills that engineers uh, will have to be very uh, good at uh, and, uh, and not focus on repetitive tasks, which as happens with many industries, it, it just goes away, uh, but <laughs> new tasks come up. Um, especially in computer science, being able to understand, you know, uh, uh, you know, how the role played by real world signals in, you know, how a conversational CX might evolve, uh, that is vastly understudied and still requires armies of engineers to deliver uh, anything remotely usable. So um, I think focusing up higher up the chain and delivering value for end users would become easier. And that's where the uh, talent, uh, interest and talent demand would be. I see. So now let's uh, put on our start looking at our crystal balls and hopefully some of you have better crystal balls than others. Uh, what is this trajectory of these AI based software generation tools that you are seeing? Is there going to be a discontinuous chain, the step function in the future, or is going to be more of a linear extrapolation of the way things have been going? It'll be step functions. You know, I think the pace of progress has been dramatic. It will continue to be dramatic in this space. I think uh, the tools are rapidly getting better. Um, there'll be substantial step functions in my view. Would you like to hazard a guess what that step, some examples of those steps? You know, I mean, I think uh, I'll give an example. There's uh, some, you know, generative AI images and music uh, applications now the rate at which they're generating data is exponential, right? Because, you know, human intervention is not required. Creativity is being generated. So if I look at just the storage that these are consuming, they're already at an exponential, right? So, you know, the my guess is the volume of code we'll write uh, that will be partly generated, partly sort of annotated, partly corrected, partly handwritten by engineers. The overall volume will vastly increase an increasing portion will be the generated part and overall productivity of all engineers and the rate at which, you know, what Arindam was saying is the you'll be writing higher level applications. You'll be sort of figuring out what are the next set of bigger grand challenge problems we should be working on uh, and what have you. Got it. Now, uh, taking a more foundational view of this. So in order to make these step functions re be realized, what do you think are some of the foundational technologies that we we still need to work on and iron out and make them more mature? Yeah, I mean, I think from it's clear that you know if you look at Microsoft Copilot or uh, OpenAI's Codex or Google's Alpha Code, these are built and trained from fairly small code snippets. Um, now imagine I throw you know, Google's X, Y billion lines of code to this training system and say, go train on this, right? I would venture to guess that you know, it'll become far better, right? Because large language models have shown that you know, GPT-3 went to 175 billion parameters and it was an exponential order of more accuracy than GPT-2. So more data, uh, more training time, more training compute resources, 
sort of develop these step functions. And I think we'll see something similar, right? We are just at the starting point. You know, this thing just caught everyone's attention and own, you know, the attention model, transformer models are less than five years old. You know, transformer model came five years back, attention model came three years back, right? So next set of, you know, breakthroughs will come as usage uh, is improved in different areas, you know, uh, ideas from different places will combine and then, you know, we'll, we'll see step functions here. So I'm a little more, usually at Google, everyone says I'm the pessimistic guy, but I'm, among this group, I feel I'm the way more optimistic person, <laughs> right? All right, so let's turn to one of the students who had an uh, intriguing question. Zach, I see you are in the audience. You had a question about the, the cyber threats and uh, the security of the data being used to train the AI models. Would you like to go ahead and ask it yourself? All right, let me ask the question that Zach had posted a, a little while back. Um, so he's talking about the increasing growth of cyber threats across the domains. And what do we need to do in order to make sure that the data that is being used to train all of these AI models is safe, it's, it's sanitized, it's not going to get us on the wrong path? Yeah, I think a super valid concern, right? I mean, the system is only going to be as good as the data you feed it. And if you feed it insecure code or what have you, you'll have trouble. The, the advantage, I mean, so one of the things that, you know, we're constantly told here, right? Uh, Google has a very large fleet that if anything has to be done manually, we'll never finish that task, right? When you have tens of millions of machines to sort of uh, work on and make sure they're operating correctly, you know, no manual approach is going to get the job done. So everything has to be automated. So you know, whether it's a bug fix or whether it's a rollout or whether it's uh, improving something, it, it has to be all automated. So the, the same thing holds true for security or, uh, you know, vulnerabilities that are discovered. You need a mechanism to detect. You need a mechanism to know how to uh, sort of root cause it, fix it, roll it out. All that has to be automated, right? So... I think that is going to be an active area of research to say, you know, how do we do this? You know, things like, you know, spectre meltdown, why did it happen? How can we detect those things? What are the key salient points we learn from it? You know, what spectre taught us is when you're tra uh, transitioning from trust boundaries from user space to kernel space, you have to be a lot more careful, right? Because that, that's where the security vulnerabilities come, come, come in. So how do you extract some of the principles that cause security vulnerabilities? How do we automatically detect that in our code? What kind of other systems do we need to write to scan our code base for such vulnerabilities? All those are, I think, fascinating areas of research that can and should be pursued. And are you hinting that these are essentially human pursuits or these are also to a large extent automatable? Um, currently, I don't, I, I'm confident they are automatable. And as you learn, you can automate more. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it's sort of very, very hard to say, you know, that computers will detect all such uh, anomalies or flaws and what have you. But every time it learns of a, a, a method by which a flaw occurs, you can build a system to say, make sure this kind of vulnerability doesn't exist in the fleet. It doesn't mean other kinds of vulnerabilities won't exist, but you'll be able to quickly translate critical learning. Let's say when you're crossing trust boundaries from user space to kernel space, what are the precautions you need to take? You know, you cannot prefetch and sort of execute, uh, you know, uh, ad nauseum to get performance without some resulting security impacts, right? So similar things, once you understand the principle that is causing an issue, that principle you can automate to make sure doesn't exist in the rest of your infrastructure and code base. But to say, find all of them, there is currently no mechanism. That is where our human intellect will have to come in to sort of figure out what are the other principles that we need to encounter here and capture here and automate and all that kind of stuff. Does that make sense? It does. Um, we have, I think, a very intriguing question which takes off from what we've discussed so far. That comes to us from Fisher. Fisher, you are in the audience. Would you like to go ahead and ask yourself? 
Uh, sure. Um, this is your ethics and values question that you posted. Sure. Uh, so my question was, uh, can AI algorithm, algorithms be programmed to understand human ethics and values? Um, and if so, how do you think this would impact the development of software? Yeah, my view is you cannot train this because even values and ethics between people are different, right? It's not something like everyone has a consistent view of what ethic, what ethical means here or what have you. There are some very foundational ones, right? And those sure, but the trickier part gets once you get into more complicated territory where there's gray area, where one person, you know, there's this different views. This it's, it's not, uh, very crystallizable easily and is very contextual. And so that happens in humans, right? I mean, politics, religion, or ethics, and these things, they are always gray because everyone has a different perspective and a view. So if humans themselves don't have a consistent view, it's hard to say that you can sort of train the system to be consistent in that, in that fashion. So inherently, this is, I think, a very, very hard problem. What you can do is for the foundational basics, you can put in guards saying, you know, obviously, you know, posting malicious content or demonizing someone or, you know, spreading hate uh, cannot be allowed. But if you look at, you know, the, the hearings that are going on in Congress where all the social, uh, uh, social network enterprises are being called into question as to why are you censoring this, why are you censoring that, everyone has a different view. And in those cases, it's really very hard to say that AI or other systems can you know, solve a problem where humans themselves do not have a consistent understanding. I think the uh, ethics is uh, uh, far more up the <laughs> uh, chain of you know, what, where capabilities are really there today. I think there are far uh, lower hanging fruit where we have to always ensure that the systems are performant especially on things like does the accuracy and it can be of anything uh you know work similarly at the similar level for any cohort in the population uh do, are we uh, able to give the similar experience to any group of uh, end users across the millions and millions of people i think those are far more uh, tractable uh, frankly, to remove biases and training data, et cetera. And that's where a lot of the work actually happens to enable trust on part of the end users in the systems. Those are more doable and automatable uh, with proven metrics. And that's where a lot of the attention goes. Uh, for the rest, uh, I think it's just pattern detection that happens for sensitive content detection. There isn't a, a self-aware system that is going to detect new patterns of offensive unless a human trains it. So these areas will continue to need uh, human involvement and close attention to develop policies and rules around which you know these systems work. Um, uh, I, I don't think uh, we are anywhere close to uh, self-aware systems. Yeah, I think a lot of work, I think, uh, you know, um, Arindam brings up a very good point about bias sort of how do you make sure the data that you're providing to the training system is not biased? And I think those are clearly problems that we have to work on. They are tractable. It will take some work, but uh, this will, we'll get better at this. But yeah, once you come to a higher level, you know, ethics and all very difficult areas because there are no good policies that uniformly are agreed upon. And that is where I think the challenge runs. And that's an area that will continue to be a difficult challenge for all of us to think about and address here. So um, next I have a stamper of a question because as far as I know, none of you work directly in that, but this is a question that's come from two of our students. Uh, Tanuj, I see you're in the audience. Would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Sure. Um... Hi, uh, my question is, how will uh, AI affect the digital design industry? Fields like RTL design and verification, will they start becoming redundant because they have a lot of coding involved in that, which nowadays things like ChatGPT is able to do quite well? None of you will become redundant, that is for sure. <laughs> but 
I mean, I can assure you that, I mean, and one of the problems we face with BLSI is, you know, detecting silent data corruption. When I was talking in Purdue, I sort of had a long discussion. I think also, I forget the name of the professor that- Ashraf, Ashraf Alam. Ashraf Alam, and there was also another one. Mark Lundstrom? Yeah, Mark Lundstrom, who were very interested in there because, you know, forget about training computers through that. I mean, even with the best of engineers, we are struggling here. But, you know, some things like, you know, can we improve the route and placement? Can we sort of uh, optimize on some of these? Can we do better verification with AI? Certainly those improvements are possible. I think there's a lot of research going on in that area with some early promise, far from a stage where you think, you know, these are easily now ready for deployment or what have you, but there is promise. Uh, but if anything, you know, um, I think Mark Lundstrom was telling me that there's that acute shortage of, you know, BLSI experts and semiconductor technology experts and understanding of, you know, BLSI systems, their aging behaviors. There's so many of these problems that we're not able to solve because we had a flood of software engineers that, you know, flooded an area of uh, the industry while the equivalent weightage that needed to go to VLSI and semiconductor physics and what have you just did not happen. So we just have an acute shortage. And if you look at President Biden's, you know, new policy of, you know, bringing those jobs back into US manufacturing as well as expertise in VLSI, that's an emphasis on the saying that currently there's a national need which we don't have, right? So certainly, I don't think any of your jobs are at risk. And if anything, the skills that you guys have will be increasing demand going forward, independent of this AI work, which will simplify many of your you know, routine tasks and make you more productive. But that will enable us all to do even bigger things, even smarter, even more efficiently uh, going down the road here. I think it is reflective of the thinking of the odd of society at large is that the overwhelming majority, the by far the largest number of questions were around this topic of how will it affect the human workforce? How will it affect the human ingenuity, human um, inspiring? How will it inspire humans versus replace humans? So that has been the overwhelming majority of the questions. Uh, I want to give a chance to any of the panelists to ask any of the other panelists any question. And then I have one. I don't have a question, but I just want to add on to the, the building block. Like I have a very nice example of how AI would enable the building block programming. So one example I would like to give is, so you have this uh, math based capture, right? Like you, you say like there is small e equation two plus three equal to what? So that you need to fill the answer. So that's the capture. So you, if you if I have to solve now, what I do is I get the image and I call some AI model detect digits that will detect the digits for me. Okay. And then depending on the type of digit, if, if depending on the operator, I'll again call some AI model to give me, hey, detect operator. And now the logic comes where programmer logic comes. If it is plus, then I call another AI model calling add and give the two strings. I don't know how to pass them. I just give the AI model two strings, which will give me the answer. So now as programmer, I don't need to think about converting the string into integer, whatever. So this, if I have to write a captcha breaker using this AI as basic blocks, this is what I would do now. So this is like one example, which is like very practical, can be done using current models. Got it. Yeah, yeah I think the captures have to get smarter, right? I mean, if yeah, robots, I, know, I, know. Can, right? I mean, you'll have to have a recapture, and then the recapture could be based on some personalized information, which only the human would know, right? I think a lot of just like this two-form authentication, the captures will yeah. get you know slightly more sophisticated in sort of making sure AI is not beating them around it. Exactly. So I, I'm really curious about seeing like what the future captures would look like. <laughs> yeah, I think two-form authentication, you know, it'll spawn ideas on how this can be sort of addressed to make sure, you know, robots are not fooling the captures. Yeah. Okay, so we are almost at the end of our session. In fact, we are going over by two minutes. But this next question uh, is one for the ages. And the 
the student is not here in the audience. Some of the students have conflicting appointments. So they see this lecture offline. But I think this is a question that made me ponder and will probably make you ponder as well. So this is a metaphysical question. Do you think that the prevalence of AI-based tools and programs like the one who should not be named is making the next generations of our humans uh, less inventive? Uh, is it uh, you know, draw drawing away from us our ability to think more creatively? So is Doesn't there an optimist amongst us? Is there a pessimist amongst us on that? I'm an optimist in this group. I mean, by the way, in my team, everyone labels me the, the eternal pessimist. But amongst this group, my sense is I'm a way bigger optimist here. Uh, I think we, if we are careful, we, it doesn't need to be. In fact, it can enhance our creativity here and, uh, you know, make us think bigger, you know, make us think uh, what else could be possible given our productivity will increase, right? Given these tools. It's the same as, you know, I think David was pointing out that we started with, you know, doing math on paper, then slide rules, then calculators, and now computers. I don't think any of those prevented uh, our creativity from, you know, being crowded or sort of uh, uh, blocked in any way. And if anything, it enabled us to think bigger, think about bigger problems, right? Uh, if we approach it that way, and if we approach it with, how can I make existing stuff better? How can I think about, you know, I talked about the uh, grand challenge problems that the National Academy of Engineering declared in 2008 as the 14 grand challenge problems for the century. At that time, they thought this is enough for the century. But I'm claiming that six of those, right, which are related to mostly computing, will be addressed by the end of this decade. And I think we are on pace for that. So we'll need new grand challenge problems. So that'll enhance our creativity. If we think bigger, it won't curtail it. If we think, oh, we are satisfied with what we have, it will curtail it. Very nice. Anybody else has a take on this? I don't know if this is a kind of new perspective, but a lot of science is driven by tools. So the microscope, the telescope, things like this, new ways to understand and, you, you know, so I don't know if this applies to coding, but it might in some senses open up new areas of understanding and creativity that, yeah, weren't there before. And so I, I'm not, I think we might need to change how we think about it to some extent, but uh, I don't think it would necessarily harm creativity. All right, let's draw the session to a close. I, I take two high level takeaways from it. One is people like the panelists, myself included, who understand the technology, who are in the midst of building this kind of technology, tend to think more positively about this than society at large. And the second is a call to arms. When we go out and we talk about this kind of technology, can we actually allay the concerns, the fears that society at large seems to have as of now, and even among our student group, they seem to uh, echo some of those concerns and amplify all the beneficial effects, all the positive effects that this kind of technology can achieve. So I think that's that's a call to arms for us. With that, let me thank uh, Rama, Arvind, David. Uh, Arindam had to drop off for another call. Uh, and this has been a wonderful session and we hope to do several other panels like this in this class uh, throughout this year. Thank you all. Thanks to the panelists and Saurabh for the opportunity. It was a great exchange. And, and to the students for making time for this. Thank you. Thank you.